Okay, so welcome to this next video in which we are discussing the protein kinase C pathway. Okay, so we've just discussed the structure of a heterotrimeric G protein. Okay, we now want to discuss what is actually meant by a heterotrimeric G protein of the GQ11 type. Okay, and for this we're going to have to discuss the different types of alpha subunits, the different types of beta subunits, and the different types of gamma subunits. Okay, so we're going to discuss the diversity of heterotrimeric G proteins. Right, so we'll start with these alpha subunits then. So, firstly, there is not just one alpha subunit, there are many different alpha subunits. Okay, there is actually 16 different genes which code for alpha subunits. Okay, and I mean now in a single copy of each chromosome. So, in a human cell you will have 46 chromosomes, but of course, really you've got 23 pairs of chromosomes. And I'm just talking about take one example of each chromosome rather than having a pair. In those one examples of each chromosome, you will have 16 genes coding for alpha subunits. Okay, so I'm, it's not really 8, and I'm just doubling it. It really is 16 in just one copy of each of the homologous chromosomes. Okay, right. However, there are 21 different alpha subunits, so this seems like a bit of an anomaly until you remember that different, well, certain genes can have multiple splice variants, okay? So let me just remind you of the central dogma of biology. So let these two lines here represent a piece of double-stranded DNA, okay? And let's say that this region of this double-stranded DNA here is a gene for some alpha subunit. Okay, so this is an alpha subunit gene. Right, so one of the strands of that DNA, um, or of that gene, will be the coding strand. So let's say this strand that I'm now colouring in purple is the coding strand. So this here, this is the coding strand. Now the coding strand is the strand that the enzyme RNA polymerase 2 will actually use to produce mRNA from. Okay, The other strand, which is complementary to the coding strand, which is now coloured in blue here, that will be the non-coding strand. So this is not the strand that the RNA polymerase enzyme uh, 2 will uh, use to make mRNA from. So this is the non-coding strand. Okay, so what will then happen is RNA polymerase 2 will work its way along the coding strands. So let's produce a piece of mRNA here. And I'll try to highlight that in turquoise. So this turquoise line here is a piece of mRNA which is complementary to that coding strand in purple. Okay, so let's bring this piece of mRNA out here. So in turquoise, here's the piece of mRNA. Now, this is not the piece of mRNA that is going to actually go through the ribosome and be translated into protein. Okay, This is the primary transcript, also called the pre-mRNA, and you must not stick this straight for a ribosome. Instead, it needs to be processed, and the reason is that in this portion of pre-mRNA, there are portions that you actually do want to be translated, but then there are also portions that you don't want to be translated. Okay, so let's box the portions that you actually do want to be translated. So let's say this is a portion you want to be translated, this is a portion that should be translated, and this also is a portion that should be translated. So all of these three portions here, okay, these are all to be translated. And there's a fancy word for that. Okay, these are called the exons. Okay, whereas all these portions in between the exons here, of which I've um, pointed to only a few of them, there's more here, these are known as the introns. Okay, so these need to go, basically. You can't actually translate those introns into protein. You'll end up with some nonsense, basically. So what's going to happen is a process called splicing. Okay, and in splicing, what happens is the exons, uh, well, the, sorry, the introns are cut out. Okay, so you're going to cut at either side of the intron and you'll cut that out. And then you're going to stick the exons back together to make a piece of mature mRNA, which is then actually ready to be translated by a ribosome into a protein. Okay, so here is the mature mRNA. And I'll colour this in in turquoise here as well. Now, 
sometimes it's the case that there is more than one way you can splice the uh, pre-mRNA, which means that there are more than one mature mRNA that you can form as the end product of splicing. Okay, so let me give you a nice, easy to understand example. So sometimes there are exons that are optional, basically. Okay, you can either have them in your final mature mRNA, or you can get rid of them just as though they were an intron. Okay, and in that case, you'd end up with two different mature mRNAs, one which had that exon, and one which didn't have that exon, and they'd code for slightly different proteins. One protein would be slightly longer, and one would be shorter. Okay, so, basically, you can produce different mature mRNAs from the same piece of pre-mRNA, and this leads to you being able to produce different proteins from the same gene, and these are known as the different splice variants of the same gene, basically. Okay, right, so this is how, even though we've got 16 genes for alpha subunits, we end up with 21 known subunits. Now, these numbers will evolve in the future, almost certainly. We will discover more splice variants or potentially even more genes that code for alpha subunits of heterotrimeric G proteins. But at the present time of making this video, I believe those are the correct figures. Okay, right. So what we're now going to discuss is the different genes for these alpha subunits. We're not quite going to go into the detail of the splice variants because the uh, terminology gets quite hideous with different people using all sorts of different things. Okay, so we'll go for the different genes then. So, uh, basically, to help us understand this, what happens, well, what someone has done is they've categorized these alpha subunits into four different families. So the four different families of alpha subunits are the G-alpha-S family, the G-alpha-I slash naught family, the G-alpha-Q slash 11 family, and now you might be understanding, and then also the G-alpha-12 slash 13 family. Okay, so these are the four families of alpha subunits of heterotrimeric G proteins. Okay, so let's start with the G-alpha-S family of alpha subunits of heterotrimeric G proteins. So this family contains two genes. It contains the gene G-alpha-S itself, the gene after which the entire family is named, and G-alpha-S produces many different splice variants. So it's one of the ones that has a hideous array of splice variants, all given hideous names. Okay, right. Uh, Next, also in this G-alpha-S family, you have a very, very similar alpha subunit that almost does exactly the same thing, which is called G-alpha-OLF, okay? And OLF stands for olfactory, and it's because G-alpha-OLF is found within the cells of the olfactory epithelium, and in the olfactory epithelium cells, it pretty much replaces G-alpha-S, i.e. they don't have much G-alpha-S, but they have a lot of G-alpha-OLF being produced, and it does pretty much the insane thing. So that's why these two have been grouped into a family, because pretty much they do the same thing, and that's a running theme for these uh, four families. Okay, right. Uh, now we go to the most complicated family, the G-alpha-I slash naught family. So this one was beautiful. This only had two members. Okay, G-alpha-I slash naught has eight members. Okay, so let's discuss the eight different alpha subunits within this family. There is the G-alpha-I1 gene. There is the G-alpha-I2 and then there is also the G-alpha-I3, okay? So this surprises people when they see it for the first time. They've always thought of G-alpha-I as being a single protein, but now it transpires there are actually three different genes coding for three different G-alpha-I proteins. They are not just different splice variants of the same gene, they have individual genes. Now they do do pretty much the same thing to the point that usually it's not uh, distinguishable which one you are working with, uh, which is why people often just talk about the G-alpha-I and assume that you realise that they mean one of them, but we don't know which, usually. Okay, right. Going on, uh, in this family you also have G alpha naught, uh, which is the other one after which the whole family is named. So these three are G alpha I, if you like, um, and then alpha naught is just one gene, okay? So there isn't 
two G alpha noughts or three G alpha noughts. There's only one of them. However, it does have multiple splice variants, so don't let this confuse you. There are not more than one G alpha naught gene. There is one G alpha naught gene, but it does have two splice variants. And the terminology is generally quite agreed on here, so I'll give it to you. So the two splice variants of G alpha naught are G alpha naught A and G alpha naught B. Okay, right. Then we'll continue on. So, uh, going on, we also have two alpha subunits called G alpha T1 and G alpha T2. Now, these are the alpha subunits of transducin within the photoreceptors in the eye. So, in the photoreceptors within the eye, the uh, receptor that picks up the light, at least in the rod cells, is rhodopsin. Okay, which is a G protein coupled receptor. There are related receptors in cone cells, uh, which are also G protein coupled receptors. And when light activates these receptors, what happens is they then interact with heterotrimeric G proteins, of course. And the alpha subunits of these heterotrimeric G proteins are sitting in front of you here. Okay, uh, but before I tell you those, um, the het the whole heterotrimeric G protein which these receptors for light interact with are known as transducin proteins. Okay, so they consist of an alpha subunit, a beta subunit, and a gamma subunit. And these two alpha subunits here, known as G-alpha T1, and that's where the T comes from, from transducin, and G-alpha T2 are alpha subunits for transducin proteins. Okay, right. So G alpha T1 is the alpha subunit of transducin that you would find in rod cells. Okay, whilst G alpha T2 is the alpha subunit of transducin that you would find in cone cells. Okay, so that's quite a nice little phenomenon there. Okay, uh, so that's G alpha T1 and G alpha T2. Now, they do slightly different things to G alpha I's and G alpha noughts. G alpha I's and G alpha naught, um, these uh, tend to inhibit adenylyl cyclases. These do something else. Uh, they uh, lower the levels of cyclic GMP within the cells. Okay, so they they work in a different way, but it's kind of analogous because these lower cyclic AMP, these lower cyclic GMP. Okay, so they're grouped together basically. Then we have some other alpha subunits, which are the ones no one's ever heard of, G alpha Z, and if you've studied the gustatory pathway away, you might have come across G alpha gust, which is also in this family. So those are the eight uh, alpha subunits of heterotrimeric G proteins that can be grouped into this G alpha I slash naught family. Okay, right. So, moving on to G alpha Q slash 11 family, which is the one we're really interested in. So, which alpha subunits are put into this family? Well, the first is G alpha Q, the one that everyone has heard of. Then there is another one called G alpha 11, okay, which is probably uh, potentially more new. Okay. Then there are two more, in fact. There's also G alpha 14, and then finally, uh, G alpha 15 slash 16. And now that is just one, that is not two. Okay, do not get confused into thinking that that's two separate alpha subunits. Let me tell you the story behind why it is called G alpha 15 slash 16. Okay, so basically there were two groups of researchers, basically. Um, one of these groups of researchers was working with mice. And they found a beautiful little alpha subunit for a heterotrimeric G protein, and they called it G-alpha-15. Later on, some other research group then found a G-alpha subunit in humans, and they called it G-alpha-16. Later, it transpired that G-alpha-16 in humans was actually completely analogous to G-alpha-15 in mice, and in fact probably was the same thing. Okay, so then there was this movement to try and get them both renamed uh, so that, you know, they were named the same thing because we didn't want it called one thing in mice and called another thing in humans. So we renamed it GR15 slash 16. However, people who are working with mice will always call it GR15 and people who are working with humans will quite often call it GR16. But it would be nice if you called it GR15 slash 16 to show willing. Okay, right. Uh, then 
finally, oh, the, well, those are the four members of that G Alpha Q slash 11 family, okay? And actually, all four of these pretty much do the same thing. So when I say we're going to be working with heterotrimeric G proteins of the uh, G Alpha Q slash 11 family, I mean any one of these. I don't just mean G Alpha Q or G Alpha 11. It could be G Alpha 14 or even G Alpha 15 slash 16. They all do pretty much the same thing. Yes, G Alpha Q is the most famous, but the others um, do the same thing as G Alpha Q. Okay, so we're going to be discussing all four of these, basically. Finally, just to complete our discussion of alpha subunits then, in the G alpha 12 slash 13 family of alpha subunits, you have two members, G alpha 12 and G alpha 13. Okay, now these ones people have generally never heard of. These are involved in cytoskeletal remodeling. Okay, so those are the alpha subunits. In the next video, what we'll do is we'll turn our attention to the beta and the gamma subunits of heterotrimeric G proteins, uh, just for completeness, and then we'll move on and see uh, the G protein cycle by which G protein coupled receptors are going to activate heterotrimeric G proteins.